Greetings everybody, it's Jim. I finally got another micro game up and running. Uh, this one, another Task Force game. Uh, it was again another one that I think I could have just jumped right into. And the reason that Starship Troopers is right over here is because it reminded me a lot of that, at least as far as the infantry go, because they have jetpacks. Now there's a little bit of consternation about about that part of the game, but I'll get that into that a little bit. Um, but anyway, today I'm going to be giving you my review of Moonbase Clavius from Task Force Games. Moonbase Clavius was designed by Kerry Anderson and came out in 1982. And of course, it's about a lunar war that happens in 1996, okay? Now, obviously, that's interesting because that time has been passed. Um, but also what makes it interesting is in the designer notes of Moonbase Clavius, uh, Kerry talks about... Uh, you know, a lot of games at the time were with big death rays, you know, science fiction ones, big death rays, mini nukes, uh, games like this probably spawned all that, like Ogre there, um, you know, everybody wanting to climb aboard the uh, science fiction train, but his was only 20 years in the future, and he wanted to subdue it a little bit because he didn't think the technology would be there. Technology be, would be there enough to have a war on the moon, but he didn't think that the weaponry would match, okay? So there are nuclear mortars, but that's about it. It's still submachine guns and rifles uh, going to town at the southern pole of the moon. Uh, and the, one of the biggest challenges is you're going to see the map, which I think is actually quite nice, is based off of the southern part of the moon, uh, you know, that, but he had a hard time getting uh, the map to work or figure it out because of the the, the, the maps that he had were all distorted and everything, but stubbornly he went forward and got it done. So anyway, let's take a look at the game. So here we have the map of Clavius itself, and Clavius is a real thing. This is at the southern part of the moon, and Clavius is one of the largest crater formations on the moon and the second largest crater on the visible near side. And it's named after the Jesuit priest mathematician Christopher Clavius. So the name Clavius is not just something made up for science fiction uh, for the game, it's actually a real deal. Now, this being 1996, I did forget to mention who the, the sides are that are fighting. Can you imagine in 1996 who would that be? Of course, it's none other than the United States and the Soviet Union. The uh, American side being the blue and the rust colored being the Soviet Union. Now, I'm going to take about 30 seconds to talk about scenario one here real quick before I get to the rules, because that's going to be kind of important, actually. Um, now, the Soviets are on the left-hand side. It's a pretty typical scenario. They've got seven turns to do one of two things. They're going to have to take all four forts. The forts are in the blue circles there. And one of the five colonies, the colonies are all in that green circle there. There are five of them there. As you can see, my forces are already on there. Uh, or they can just take all five colonies. So... Four of the forts, one of the colonies, or all five colonies. They got seven turns to do so. So here we have the some of the units. And as you can see by the die cut, unfortunately, it wasn't really centered. And I got uh, some of mine... Uh, my uh, nomenclature on the units were cut off there. Now, it doesn't really matter because it's the numbers that actually matter that, you know, show what a unit is as much as the nomenclature. And with the exception of two units, which luckily mine were fine, and that is the nuclear mortars and the conventional mortars. You have to distinguish between two of those. We'll get into why that's a big deal in a little bit. Uh, one thing I would say is the terrain effects chart is actually done right. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, the movement cost per hex, the part, the column on the right, that's where it's sorted. It's just, I can't stand it when they sort it by the terrain type alphabetically or anything like that it, because it should not be, you know, when because when you're looking at the movement cost per hex, it's like, I don't want it to say one, three, two, one, four, whatever, because that constantly makes me look at the chart. While this, I can look at it and say, okay, craters and rough hexes are the only ones I have to worry about. Everything else is one. That's the way it should be. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's tempting to say, hey, just crater walls and roughs should be mentioned and then everything else just not. But because you still need to have reference for the symbols uh, so you can look at the map. So otherwise colonies, in this case, colonies, forts, and mining facilities, they could easily be interchangeable if you didn't know. Okay, because I mean, I know what a rough is and a crater is and even the transport system, uh, the road system is, you know, I know what those are in, you know, I've been playing enough war games, but Colony Fort Mine Facility, yeah, I would actually have to uh, make sure I know which one's which there. Now, the funny, ironic part about this whole thing is when you look at that movement cost per hex, the SPB is in parentheses there, that means self-propelled battery. That means tanks. 
Now, what's the big deal about that? It's because tanks are the only ground unit in the game, and there's hardly any of them. So they went through all this trouble about movement costs, when the truth is, you, you might be thinking, what about the infantry that are right there that you're showing? Remember, they got rocket packs. They're considered air units. Even the mortars are considered air units. So hey, everybody can just go 10 hexes anywhere. So what's the point of terrain, just for the tanks? Well, terrain actually does still matter, but it matters only in combat for these air units. So we'll get into that in a little bit. And just as a reminder, folks, if you've come this far in the video, there's a good chance you've liked the video. I hope so anyway. Please take a moment to smash that like and subscribe button and just let me know I'm doing a good job. I do appreciate it. So here we have the combat results table, and it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. I mean, it's not the combat odds version, which is standard. It's not even the differential type that we've seen in other uh, micro games. This is actually done by the terrain type of where the target is at, at the time. So that's kind of interesting. Now, there's two ironies here. Okay, first, the self-propelled batteries, the tanks, uh, as we mentioned before, were the only unit in the game affected by terrain when they were moving. The thing is here, none of it is affecting it when it comes to being shot at. Okay, the SPBs have their own column, as you can see on the right-hand side. Now, the other thing you might be thinking is, well, what about all the air units? How are they affected by terrain in combat? Well, that's because basically the, the, the self-propelled packs and all that is only good for traveling. I mean, you're not going to get into combat with it, right? Uh, so you are going to land and then you do combat and you'll be in that terrain. Now, one of the things here that's very uh, important, very important, is you do have to gang up, just like in many other war games, to do any kind of damage. Matter of fact, there is no other damage other than destruction. You either eliminate your target or you do not. Okay, and just to give you an idea of how um, weak the units are by themselves, uh, that Soviet units on the right hand side there have a strength of eight. And if you look on the column there, on the, the strength points eight, and just say you're shooting at anything, and I do mean anything because the, their relative strength means nothing. It's all about where where they're at. So let's just say they're in the middle of the open with in a plane. So you need a four or less on two dice to eliminate it, or you get nothing. So obviously you're going to be stacking units as much as you can. You can only stack three units in a hex. Okay, so you're going to be surrounding guys and combining fire just to eliminate them. Now, the thing is, when you're combining fire, here's how it's figured out. Um, all, the, all the firepower that you bring into a hex and you divide it by the number of units in that hex, uh, either one, two, or three, because three is the maximum. Okay, so in this game, you're, I mean, one of my first turns, my first firings on the first turn, I got had a 61. <laughs> so, and you're rounding down, so it was a strength of 20. OK, and, um, you know, it was just kind of interesting. It eliminated the entire uh, I actually was in a, a firing in a fort. Uh, so I needed six or less. I actually got everybody on that one shot. But I had everybody around it to get that result because, again, you're dividing it by three. Now, the, the only difference is nuclear mortars. If you have, this is why you have to differentiate nuclear mortars and regular mortars. Uh, they do have a range of one, but that's not really the strength here. The idea is after you've def you've uh, figured out what your your combat value is, then you add the nuclear mortars, and they don't have to. You don't have to add. I mean, divide depending on how many people are in the hex. All right, so they're very they're actually quite strong. Um, but as you can see. Um, you do definitely have to gang up on somebody. And the, the problem with this is, and I'll go back to the, the main map here uh, for the first turn, is you only got seven turns to make it across, all right, and capture all those places. Uh, and this leads up to a defense that I'll talk to in a little bit about what happens. Let's go over what happens in turn one here. So the Soviets always move first in any of these scenarios. And the first thing I did with the Soviets was in the upper left is just go right to that fort and just surround it, knowing I had to definitely gang up on it, leaving the other forces alone to go do their own thing on their own turn. I definitely wiped everybody out there and used everybody else to go to the bottom right. Uh, since ganging up was a thing, I kind of kept on that theme. Um, now, the thing is, you might say um, from a previous term about the American forces, it seems like a lot of them just really got to where they needed to be on the bottom left here real quick. Um, that is also because of two reasons. One, 
everything was an air unit in the game. There were no SPBs. There were no tanks. Didn't have to worry about uh, terrain at all. But not only that, but the monorail system, uh, or the roads if you want to call them that, basically if you're on the monorail system, you can go anywhere on the monorail system and everything's connected. So it's like you can go anywhere. The only time a monorail will stop you is if you're in an enemy zone of control or the, the Soviets destroy part of the monorail system. Okay, they destroy hex. You'll stop there for obvious reasons. But yeah, definitely if movement wasn't already unlimited enough, that really did the trick. So it's a little bit weird. Uh, so let's go to turn three here. And just to show you, just this is before the catastrophic events here. Um, the Soviets tried to gang up on, on a hex. They got nothing in either section, in either front here. And of course, the, the American units blasted six units out of the uh, out of the moon. Uh, six Soviet units were gone. And that's mainly because they had the nuclear mortars to add up. Okay, that, that added a lot of strength to them to make sure that they were able to roll 10 or less or even 11 or less at times. And at that point, the game was already kind of over. I mean, with six units gone and you having to, and the Soviet player having to continue and get have seven turns to try to capture all four forts or get in the middle, and didn't think it was going to happen. But fate took a turn, and when I was taking a picture, my phone fell, and there was an earthquake on the moon. Typical wargaming destruction. Luckily, this is a mini game and only takes like, you know, 30 to 45 minutes to play. So... Uh, a disaster kind of happened, but it actually uh, worked out anyway because I think the Soviets actually got toast. Okay, so the Soviet Union was obviously pretty much lost at that point. Uh, you know, when you have a, a catastrophic loss like that in a game that demands a lot of units to destroy a lot of units, it's usually easier just to reset the game and call it good. Um, but the thing is, I do think in that scenario, uh, if I think there might be a possible break in this scenario where it's broken um, just because of the way that the game really makes it hard for you to destroy units any other way other than ganging up uh, with a time limit, that is. Um, where the American player could just uh, put one unit around every uh, fort and city and just, you know, hold up that way, you know, even out in the open, just as cannon fodder, which is ironic because the Soviet Union would be more known to do that, like in World War II, where they just send them in waves of humanity, <laughs> you know. Um, but at the same time, you know, because it's so tough, even a stack of three going up against uh, one unit in the open is still 50% chance to fail, right? So it, it's interesting. Now, that might break that scenario, but that doesn't mean the game's necessarily broken. I'm up in the air of whether, um, you know, the bottom line is I'd have fun finding out. So I guess in that in that regard, to play the other scenarios, uh, which are longer than seven unit, seven turns, uh, see how the game changes. I mean, you know, it, it, yeah, the American can, player can go anywhere real quick because of that monorail system but also because they have 10 movement points but maybe if uh you know if they commit too much you can just kind of do an end run blow up the monorail at one point and then go over and try to take the other spots over now, there's all kinds of things you could do but the soviet player definitely needs more time to do any kind of attack um so uh it would be interesting to see how those play out i if you play the game i like to hear your comments below of what you thought of it um but the bottom line is hey it's like you can probably pick it up for like 10 15 bucks maybe on ebay uh there's a few of these out there so you're not losing out there maybe you can trade for it um and it would be fun fun enough i mean i can think of worse things to do i've spent money on movies that i'd be more disappointed on even if this was broken Okay, so anyway, that's Moonblaze Clavius, and I'll see you next video.